Fire Physics 20s, Mr. Jukley here. One last time. This is actually our very, very last lesson of all of Physics 20, which is kind of exciting and a little bit sad at the exact same time. Uh, it's a cool lesson, at least. It's Doppler effect. Um, I guess we'll, we'll jump right in. By the way, this is lesson number nine. Uh, and you may notice that the screen looks a little bit different. There's lots of animations in this. So I'm going to be working on PowerPoint, and you know how much I love working on PowerPoint. So it might have some technical issues, but we will do our best with it. So when we talk about uh, sound waves, and we talk about them created by a single stationary source, they spread out in all directions, right? So if I'm on a speaker right now, it doesn't really matter where you are in the room. The sound is spreading out equally in all directions. So the source is this little red dot right in the middle. It's red now, it wasn't before. This little red dot right in the middle, it's vibrating in and out of the page, and this is actually a top-down view, so as if you're looking top-down. Now this might look like if you had a puddle and you threw a rock into the puddle, so there's the rock right there, and you get the ripples that come out in circular pattern around it. Exactly the same idea, except significantly better drawn uh, and a better animation. So hopefully that makes sense for people. The sound that is coming out of your mouth, out of your speakers, uh, out of your little cats or something, I have no idea. Um, it travels out equally in all directions. Cool. What we've talked about so far, and what we've gone through and talked about is a ray of a wave rather than a than a full-on 2D wave. So we've talked about one particular path. So some definitions with this new uh, thing, this new idea that we're talking about. We're talking about that uh, stationary source with sound moving out in all directions. Uh, the wavelength is the same in all directions around it, right? And when we look at that wavelength, the wavelength is the distance between two crests, and the crests, what we're looking at here, uh, that's up here, crests are our solid lines that go around. Troughs aren't really shown on this diagram, but troughs sometimes are represented by dotted lines, or sometimes not rented, represented by anything, it's just exactly in between the solid lines. And then remember, as we're going through and we're talking about sound waves, we're not actually talking about crests and troughs. In reality, we're talking about uh, compressions and rarefactions. So keep in mind, keep that in mind. Um, again, pretty straightforward, I hope, right? Traveling in all directions, know what the crest looks like, know what the trough looks like. Um, if the this, if this source is stationary, uh, what, the frequency is the same, right? And, and which property of a wave doesn't change once it leaves the source? Well, it's the frequency. Frequency does not change once it leaves the source. So let's skip forward a second here. So in other words, I got a tuning fork that makes sound at 40 hertz. So 40 cycles per second, or in this case, it vibrates back and forth 40 times every single second. Once that wave leaves that source, well, it's 40 cycles per second pretty much no matter what, as long as, and it's down at the bottom here, as long as the source and the receiver remain stationary. And this is getting into talking about Doppler effect. So producing 40 hertz sound with 40 hertz over here, the person picks up the exact same frequency, 40 hertz over there. Cool. But what if the person is moving, right? And I always like to think about this as like I'm in a canoe or something, I go with the waves or I go against the waves. So in this case, you're going with the waves. And as you're moving in this direction, more of those waves, more of those compressions are going to hit you in the same time. Right, so the person, well, the tuning fork is making something that's, that creates 40 hertz, right? The person is going to hear more of those cycles in less time. They're not going to hear 40 hertz. They're going to actually hear greater than 40 hertz. That's supposed to be a four. I kind of messed it up. So greater than 40 hertz. This is the Doppler effect. It's the apparent change in frequency due to the relative motion of the source and the receiver the apparent change in frequency due to the relative motion between the source and the receiver. So if you're hearing more cycles per second, more cycles per second, that means you're actually 
hearing a higher apparent frequency, which for us corresponds to a higher, hopefully this doesn't change, pitch. got to remember how to handwrite higher pitch sound, All right? So more cycles in the same amount of time, more crests or compressions in the same amount of time means a higher frequency and therefore a higher pitch. Cool. Next piece to talk about is, well, what if the, in this case, it looks like the source is moving away. So if the source is moving away from the receiver, that means you're going to actually have less crests or compressions per second, which means you're going to have a lower pitch. So moving towards higher pitch, moving away lower pitch. The formula that predicts this, and I'm going to show you this formula. We're probably going to skip over the example. If you want to try out the formula, it's fine. You're not really going to see it in physics 30 anywhere, uh, but you may see it way down the road in university. Honestly, you might forget about it by the time you get to university. So uh, whatever, I'll show it to you now. And then uh, you can try it out. You can not try it out, but I will point out a couple important things. So. FA is our apparent frequency. That's the frequency that is being heard. FS is the source frequency, so the actual frequency of the source of sound as it's being given off. VW is the velocity of the wave. VS is the velocity of the source. So some people get confused because they're like, oh, VS, that's the velocity of sound. No, it's not. It's velocity of the source. The speed of sound would be the velocity of the wave because it's a sound wave. So hopefully that kind of makes sense. Now there's two tricky things about this formula. I guess three if you count what I just talked about. Two tricky things are you have to make a choice whether you're adding or subtracting on the bottom over there in the denominator. And then the other thing is the rearranging can be a little bit tricky. A little bit. You can handle it, but a little bit tricky. So things to know about. This, if the source is moving towards the receiver, we know that we should have a higher apparent frequency. So a larger apparent frequency. We need this side to increase, which means this side also needs to increase. So if I'm dividing by VW minus VS, I want that to be as small as possible. Because when we divide by a smaller number, we end up with a bigger number. So for example, let's take 100 and then divide it by 50. That's equal to 2. If I take 100 and divide it by, say, 2, it's equal to 50. So as this denominator, get, denominator gets smaller, this side of the equation increases. As this side of, or sorry, as this denominator gets bigger, this side decreases. That's that inverse relationship. So we want this to be small to have this big, a higher frequency or a larger frequency. Cool. So then you'll probably guess if it's moving away. Eventually, if it's moving away, we're going to add same idea. We want the denominator to be big so that our apparent frequency is smaller. Cool. Very, very cool. Very good. So for this example, I just want you to think about this for a second. We're not going to go through and solve it in its entirety. You can if you want to, but uh, we're just going to look at the big ideas from this. So uh, we've got an ambulance siren is 700 hertz. The frequency that you hear, though, is 748 hertz. The speed of sound through air is 345 meters per second. And we want to figure out first, is it moving towards us or away from us? And what is its actual speed in, for some reason, once in kilometers per hour? I think it's really close to 80 kilometers per hour, 80-ish, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, kilometers per hour, in case you're trying to solve this. Okay, so the speed of sound, that's the velocity of the wave. We're looking for the speed of the ambulance. That's going to be the speed of the source, is our question mark. The ambulance siren, well, that's the thing that's creating it, so this is FS. And what you hear, so frequency of the source, is your apparent frequency, so that one is FA. Just getting those down can be a little bit tricky for some people. So let's let's have a quick look at these two questions here. Uh, <clears throat> first and foremost, is the ambulance moving towards or away from you? So what we know is our apparent frequency is greater than our source frequency. Therefore, I'm going to use these three little, nope, I'm not going to use those apparently. 
Therefore, let's try that one more time. Uh, therefore, it is moving, let's see, towards you. There it is. That's what I was looking for. Uh, second part of this, like we, I'm not going to go through and solve again, but I've got my formula FA equals FS times VW over VW plus or minus VS. I left the plus or minus blank there. So if it is indeed moving towards us, we should know that that would be negative. Now that we got the formula, all we would need to do is rearrange and solve. Cool. So next little piece. Okay, that's fine. That's some space to work. That's all good. Uh, next little piece, there are a couple of applications of this. So one is radar guns. If you've ever got a speeding ticket, uh, two things. One, you need to slow down, and two, this is interesting. This is how they work. So radar laser. So essentially what happens is they send out radar, which is radio waves, and they send them out at a very, very particular frequency, 2.4 gigahertz. They hit a vehicle, and then they bounce back to the gun. So the gun is both the source and the receiver, the gun being the radar gun, uh, both the source and the receiver. And then based on the apparent change in frequency, they can actually tell how fast that car is going. And it's pretty much the exact same math that we just looked at there. So uh, let's see. This case, it would reflect back at a lower frequency because the car is moving away from the source. So if we wanted to actually do the math, we'd say our apparent frequency, which is going to be, in this case, our reflected frequency, is equal to the frequency from the radar gun. That's our source frequency. And this looks a little bit upside down for some reason, but the speed of the radar minus the speed of the car, I think this should be flipped now that I've never actually noticed that before. Uh, Flip that upside down. But anyways, long story short, you can solve for the speed of the car. The reason why we've replaced C is because C is the speed of light, and radar travels at the speed of light. So it's, it's radio waves. Okay, where are we here? There we go. Okay, so shock waves is the next thing we want to talk about. So this is what the moving source would look like if we were dealing with the Doppler effect. So if a, you're a person standing right here, Obviously, you're getting more cycles per second, more cycles per second than you would if it was a stationary source. If you're a person standing over here, you'd get less cycles per second, right? So low frequency or lower frequency and then high frequency on this side. Cool. So there's Doppler effect. But what if it was going a little bit faster and a little bit faster? and a little bit faster, and a little bit faster. So that's where we start to get into these shock waves, which is pretty cool. So here it is traveling at the speed of sound. So now that dot is traveling at the speed of sound. So sound goes a particular speed. It's giving off a sound wave, but then it's traveling with that sound wave. So along with that sound wave at the exact same speed. So picture your person standing right here. Continue drawing that person. You'd hear, wait for it. Nothing, 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 nothing. And then all of a sudden, you'd have all of those crests. So all of those crests all at once. Circle them right. No, nope, can't do it. It's moving too quickly for me. All of those crests all at once hitting the person. All of those crests are like a huge compression. Compression on top of compression on top of compression. And when they release, it's like an explosion. That is a shock wave in a nutshell. Uh, so this is traveling at the speed of light, and then what would you hear after the thing passed? So let's say that it's already passed you and you're over here. Really spread out, so really spread out waves, really low rumble. Uh, one thing that you can do with this is you can actually check out, go and look up uh, air show speed of sound, and you'll actually be able to see and kind of experience, you hear nothing, 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 and then all of a sudden that loud, low rumble as the plane passes over you. Uh, this is a picture of an actual bullet traveling some, through some sort of fluid. I don't remember which kind it is, but you can actually see those compressions in the fluid over on this side. Pretty cool. Pretty cool stuff. Now, what if we're traveling faster than the speed of sound? By the way, Mach 1 is the speed of sound. So Mach 1.4 would be 1.4 times the speed of sound. So in this case, you're giving off sound waves, but then you're actually going faster than the sound waves. So they're constantly trailing behind you. Now, if you're at an air show for this, same sort of thing. Nothing, 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 nothing. And then kablow right there where all of those sound waves 
right along this line, and I wish I could move that along. I probably could if it was in the other thing, but then the other thing doesn't do animation, so hooray for PowerPoint. Um, nothing, 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 and then as soon as that line hits you, where you've got compression on top of compression, kablow, it's, it literally sounds like an explosion, which is pretty cool. Go, go check out Airshow videos. Look up... Uh, Speed of sound, air show, or something along those lines. You'll you'll come up with pictures like this. Now that explosion, that kaplawi, is called a sonic boom, right? A sonic boom. Uh, this is the Concorde jet. They're actually not allowed to fly anymore. Uh, that was the one passenger jet that could go faster than the speed of sound, and it was only allowed to go faster than the speed of sound over oceans if it was ever traveling over land. Nuh-uh, not allowed to go faster than the speed of sound because of that sonic boom. The other thing that you can check out, and you can even see those in those videos that uh, hopefully you just watched, is um, when you're watching airplanes go at or just above the speed of sound, you often see these clouds forming, right? Any ideas why those clouds form? Well, you've got compression, on top of compression, on top of compression, on top of compression, because it's making the sound and then traveling with that sound. When you have all of those compressions, you make ridiculously high air pressure, and that ridiculously high pressure causes the water vapor in the air to actually condense into a cloud, which is pretty cool, pretty neat stuff. Uh, so here's a couple other pictures of it. A couple other pictures, very neat. Okay, other things with waves. So there are a couple, like it's random pieces that we got to go through with waves. Uh, the law of reflection, you've heard about this in grade eight or something like that. Your incident angle needs to be the same as your reflected angle. No problem, piece of cake. So when we're dealing with a 2D wave, we're dealing with all of these lines. When we're dealing with just a ray, which we typically do, just deal with a ray, we're dealing with it coming in and bouncing off at the exact same angle. Now, one important thing is it needs to be compared to a normal line. Normal line, by definition, is at 90 degrees to the surface. So your angles need to be compared to the normal line, not to the surface when you are representing uh, when you are representing uh, incident and reflected angles. Uh, that's going to be more important for physics 30, but we might as well start talking about it right now. The other thing is theta r, notice it's a capital R, so don't be lazy about this, capital R is for refraction, that's the bending of light, or the bending of waves, sorry, as they go from one medium to another, so lowercase r for reflection, capital R for refraction, and refraction is more of a physics 30 concept. Cool, okay. Next thing is diffraction. So diffraction is when waves bend when they go through an opening or a slit, uh, as long as it's close to the wavelength of the incoming wave train. Uh, so through a slit, around an opening, or sorry, around a corner, stuff like that. Um, that's around a corner. There's two things that affect the amount of diffraction that occurs. There's the size of the opening, and then there's the wavelength. So all of these waves are traveling at the same wavelength, or with the same wavelength, I guess I should say, things that we notice is a really, really small opening causes lots of bending, whereas a bigger opening causes less bending, and an even bigger opening causes even less bending. So the diffraction increases as the size of the opening decreases. The next thing is the wavelength. So you'll notice on this that the size of the opening from there to there and from there to there is actually exactly the same on both of these. It's the wavelength that has now changed. So we've got a longer wavelength and we've got a shorter wavelength. So which one diffracts more? Longer wavelength or shorter wavelength? Long diffracts more. So the longer the wavelength, the greater the diffraction. A couple things to know, mostly just knowledge pieces at this point but it's still good things to know. Now, when we have waves interfering with each other, we've kind of talked about, well, no, we've definitely talked about constructive and destructive, but what about in a 2D situation? So I've got 2D waves interfering with each other. Some nice homework for the summer might be find a nice pond, so a nice neat pond, go to the nice neat pond and try to throw two rocks into it at the exact same time. Each rock will create its own let me do that one more time. Each rock will create its own circular wave, and the circular wave from one will interfere with the circular wave from the other, and it'll create a nice, neat pattern 
that looks like this that I'm going to get you to watch a video to help explain it a bit more. But uh, long story short with this, and again, the animations are kind of hard to draw on. We've got crests and troughs. We could say that the purple is a crest. So purple equals crest. So we could say that the green is a trough. doesn't really matter which. But we've got these two openings. So around each of these openings, they're creating their own circular wave fronts. But then the circular wave front from one is interfering with the circular wave from, from the other and creating constructive and destructive interference. So where we see definitive blue and purple, sorry, green and purple, so it's there and there, there and there, there and there, that's where we would have constructive interference. If it's sound, it would be loud. If it's uh, light, it would be dim. The other thing that we have is we have these sort of blurs that aren't really green, aren't really purple, that go there, there, and there. Those are going to be completely destructive interference. If we're talking about destructive interference in terms of sound, it would be quiet. If we're talking about uh, destructive interference in terms of light, it would be uh, bright light that we're talking about there. So again, this is sort of the pattern uh, that we look at. And from source one, I've got crest. Crest, 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 and from source two, same thing. How can I switch the color of this? Nothing's showing up in the bottom corner like I want it to. Nothing, there we go. Ah, uh, let's do orange for this one. And then do I have a pen? Nice. So crest, 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 and finally crest and then we see in different places let's switch the color again here let's do whatever color that is i end up with crest with crest that's constructive crest with crest crest with crest 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 and obviously troughs as well so we'd have a really really loud or bright spot there same thing crest 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 also trough trough we'd have another bright spot there or loud spot depending on if it's light or uh, sound. So another one right there. And then we have destructive interference. Let's see if I can get another different color here. Let's do that one. Destructive interference where I have a crest with a trough. That's actually too similar of a color for me. Might be okay for you, but for the colorblind guy, not so much. Crest with trough. Then I've got a crest with a trough, a crest with a trough, a crest with a trough, and so on and so on. So we've got these areas where we've got complete destructive interference. And we've got it there, 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 there. And again, a line with destructive interference. So it's, okay. it's one thing to kind of show this in... Uh, it's one thing to show this in... Uh, hey, move forward. Uh, in like something that's still and not really moving. It's another thing to show it in terms of uh, like how it actually works as well as, uh, as well with, with like good animations. So this person, Veritasium again, this YouTube channel, a fantastic physics YouTube channel, the original double slit experiment. It's more to do with EMR and light but the ideas work exactly the same for Physics 20. That first one is also very entertaining. Uh, the second one is more the why behind it. And for this one, only really watch until about two minutes in. I mean, you can watch as long as you want, but um, really two minutes is, is what you need for this course. Cool. So put it on pause. I would watch those now before we move forward too much. So put it on pause. Check out those couple videos uh, right now before we move forward. Uh, so if we want to be able to predict uh, the interference based on measurement, we need the wavelength first and foremost. So for this one, it tells us the wavelength is one centimeter. And we need to measure the distance from one of the sources out to the point in space and from the other source out to that point in space. And I might actually, I'm going to put the video on pause myself here and get to a thing where I can actually move stuff around, which is going to be good. So yeah, I want this. But I want to skip way, way, way forward. Sorry about this, folks. I didn't actually put it on pause either, did I? Just kind of started going for it. Yeah, all right. So, perfect. That's the one we were on. Um, oh, wait. So we measure the distances to P. Awesome. One of them might be five centimeters and one might be three centimeters. Uh, the difference between the two path 
distances. So delta D 2.0, that's a whole number multiple of the wavelength, which means it's going to be in phase and means it's going to be constructive interference, which means it's going to be an anti-node or a loud spot or a bright spot, depending on what we're dealing with. Now, if I wanted to go through and actually look at this formula, why if the path difference, and this is the big idea, um, why if the path difference is a whole number multiple of the wavelength itself, we end up with constructive interference, so we look at source one, and source one has to go through one full wavelength, two, three, four, five full wavelengths, five full wavelengths. And it's starting with a crest, and what does it end up with? It ends up as a crest. For source two, it has to go through, let's see, one, two, three full wavelengths, but because it goes through three full wavelengths, it starts as a crest and it ends up as a crest. So I've got five wavelengths and I've got three wavelengths. Actually, I want to do that one in a different color and I've got three wavelengths looking like this. Now, if I were to take this wavelength and if I were to, can I rotate it a little bit and line it up? So one of them had to travel a little bit further. Doesn't matter really the angle very much, but notice what we've got here. We've got a crest plus a crest. Perfect, so that is constructive interference. If we wanted to do this with uh, same thing, so same wavelength of, of one centimeter, but what's the path difference between these two? 4.5 centimeters and two centimeters. So if we said, the path difference is a, when it's a whole number multiple wavelength, we have constructive. 2.5 centimeters is not a whole number multiple of one. We're probably going to have destructive interference. So destructive interference. So again, let's check this out. Let's try and understand why. So I've got, starting with a crest, I've got one, two full wavelengths. So I end up with a crest. For the other one, it's 4.5 centimeters. So I've got one, two, three, 4.5 centimeters, that's only four and a half wavelengths. So that means we end up with a trough there. So same thing in this case, let's draw this same sort of way here. So if I line these ones up, uh, let's go there and let's go, how do I rotate that again? And let's go to there, perfect. They're gonna end up with destructive interference, we're gonna end up with a trough and a crest at the exact same place. So long story short, if the path difference is a whole number multiple of the wavelength, but not the other way around, so where n is one, two, three, four, a whole number, it's constructive. If it's not, it's destructive. Cool, so you'll, you'll see that again later. Um, Physics 30, you'll see that a little bit. So not a ton of practice with this last lesson, um, but a lot of stuff to kind of know the idea of. Well, it's with mixed emotions that I am ending this one. Uh, on one side of things, I'm happy you're done Physics 20. You've done the work that you need to do in Physics 20. I'm hoping you're ready to go for Physics 30. On the other side of things, I'm a little bit sad because, well, you're done Physics 20 and I really... Well, I'm going to miss you. Um, hopefully I see people in Physics 30. That would be fantastic. Uh, remember, in these COVID times, if you're not ready for Physics 30, uh, there's absolutely no shame in repeating this course. Uh, that being said, if you're watching this video, if you've done the practice, if you've finished some assignments, you're probably honestly ready to go to Physics 30. Uh, but just make an informed decision on that one. Anyways, everybody. It's been fantastic teaching you, even though it's been from a distance this semester. Um, please keep in touch. Please uh, let me know how things go, and we'll see you at the meet for next week. Anyways, bye for now.